Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Nunley Math. Thank you so much for joining us here today. I'm your host, Aaron Nunley. I appreciate you being with us as we kind of wrap up our exponent rules and exponent properties unit. Um, we spent several days talking about what exponents are and how they work. Uh, we spent a few days uh, talking about zero as an exponent, exponents that are negative. And then in our last video, we talked about the multiplication properties of exponents or certain patterns that emerge when we take numbers with exponents and we try and simplify them. Um, we talked about how expanded form of our exponents can be used to demonstrate rules, but then we can use those rules to make the process of combining things a little faster or simpler. We're going to do something very similar to that today with our division properties of exponents. So let's take a look at a couple problems. Um, just like before, you can see I've got one, two, three examples we're going to work through, and then we're going to draw a conclusion about those examples that hopefully will save us a lot of time and effort. Um, again, when we work through these three examples, I'm going to do these in slow, drawn-out, painful detail because I want to make sure we understand that our exponent rules aren't pulled out of thin air, but rather they are derived from certain properties of mathematics that everybody uh, knows um, and everybody agrees to and that can be proven. So let me show you what I'm talking about. If I have 5 to the fifth power divided by 5 to the second power or 5 to the fifth over 5 to the second if you prefer to think of this as a fraction and I ask you to simplify this we can use what we know about exponents to write both the numerator and the denominator in an expanded form. Notice 5 to the fifth power is 5 times 5 times 5 times 5 times 5 and 5 squared is just 5 times 5. This is an expanded form of this exponent expression. And then I want to think about ways I can simplify this expression. Well, if I think of this as a fraction and I try and use my fraction rules, we know that if we have a number divided by itself, that number is equal to a 1. So when I look through here, I notice that I have lots of 5's on top and I have a couple 5's on bottom. I can take a 5 over 5 and I can simplify it into a 1 over 1 or just a 1. I'm going to do that here. I'm going to take this 5 right here on the top and this 5 on the bottom and I'm going to take that and treat it as if it makes a 1. And I'm going to do the same thing here. 5 over 5 becomes a 1 over 1. I'm doing the same thing I did back in our simplifying fractions lessons, um, which you can go back and watch at a different point in time if that's too big of a struggle right now. Um, but for now, suffice it to say that anything divided by itself always makes a 1 which means that I have 1 times 1 times 5 times 5 times 5 on top, and I have a 1 times 1 on bottom. Well, the 1 times 1 don't do anything because of the identity property. Multiplying by 1 doesn't do anything. So I can simplify this to just be 5 times 5 times 5, or in exponent form, I could write this as 5 to the third over 1, and anything over 1 is just itself, 5 to the third. Now, this is a very long, drawn-out way of doing this. Ideally, what we want to be able to do is get from here down to here without having to do all this expanded form and simplifying fractions things. Now, hopefully, you can look at this and see a pattern that you think might work. If not, pause the video, take a second, look it over. I think it might come to you. For now, I'm not going to say what that pattern is. I'm just going to let you hold it in your head for a second. And I'm going to put a second example up here. If you think you have a pattern that works in example A, I would recommend that you write down example B and that somewhere off to the side, you go ahead and see if you can predict what that uh, would look like in a simplified form. I'm going to go ahead and do this out the long, painful way to show you that mathematically it makes sense, and then we're going to see if your rule holds up. Notice the numerator is four nine or is nine fours multiplied together. The denominator is 5 4s multiplied together, so in expanded form it looks like this. Now, just like before, we said that anything divided by itself 
is always a 1. So I'm going to look through here and I'm going to try and find examples of things that can be simplified to 1. Well, here's a 4 over 4. 4 over 4 is 1 over 1. And here's a 4 over 4, which is a 1 over 1. And here's a 4 over 4, which is a 1 over 1, and a 1 over 1, and a 1 over 1. In fact, I was able to take five sets of 4 over 4 and simplify those into 1s. Notice the denominator is just a bunch of 1s multiplied together, so my denominator is going to be a 1. My numerator is 4 times 4 times 4 times 4, and then all these 1s really don't do anything. That's the identity property of multiplication. Multiplying by 1 doesn't do anything. So I can write this as 4 times 4 times 4 times 4 over 1. Now, dividing by 1 doesn't do anything, so I could just write this as 4 times 4 times 4 times 4, or 4 to the 4th. Is that what you predicted? You see, the goal is to be able to get from here down to here without having to go through all of this trouble every single time. If you have a rule that you think is going to work, I would recommend that down here in example C, you try your rule again. See if you can make it work before I show it out the long way. I'm going to go ahead and do that. This is four A's on top, six A's on bottom. I'm going through and I'm looking for all the ones. Remember, anything divided by itself is a one, so it doesn't matter that I don't know what A is. If it's over itself, it's a 1. If a had a value of 4, 4 over 4 would be 1. If a had a value of 7, 7 over 7 is a 1. Whatever it is, if it's over itself, it makes a 1. Here's another 1, and another 1, and another 1. Notice when we simplify this, 1 times 1 times 1 times 1 on the numerator would make a 1. The denominator is going to be a times a, and then all these times 1's don't do anything, so you get 1 over a squared. Now, you may have found that this threw a little bit of a wrench into whatever rule you came up with. Probably with your rule, you were probably more likely to come up with something like this, a to the negative second. But keep in mind that a to the negative second says use the reciprocal of a to the second. So you probably weren't able to go from here straight to here using your shortcut, but you were probably able to figure this out. Does this match the rule you used up here and up here? Hopefully it does, because there's a property that tells us when we divide numbers with like bases, they can, it can be done quickly by subtracting the exponents. Notice if I had 5 on top and 2 on bottom, 5 minus 2 leaves me with 3. If I have 9 on top and 5 on bottom, 9 minus 5 leaves me with 4. If I have 4 on top and 6 on bottom, that leaves me with negative 2, which then just simplifies to be 2 on the bottom. This is a really good thing to notice. Um, notice that when I get a negative exponent, a negative 2, all that's telling me is the 2's aren't on top, or the 2a's aren't on top, the 2a's are on bottom. Nice little shortcut for you. This is called the quotient of powers property, and in fancy math form it's written this way. Like bases, they both have exponents, we subtract those, to find our value. So let's take a look at what this looks like um, in, in a practice problem. This one you'll notice is a little more complicated than the ones we did on the previous page because we've got not just a single variable on top, but I've got a 5, 5x's, five and 4y's. On the bottom I've got a 15, 2x's, and 2y's. But I can use the same strategy for solving something that looks like this. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to think of these as distinct parts. 5 and 15, x to the 5th and x squared, y to the 4th and y squared. And then I'm going to go through and I'm going to simplify each of these parts the exact same way I did on the previous slide. Notice 5 over 15 will simplify x to the fifth over x squared 
will simplify. y to the fourth over y squared will simplify. And here's what I end up with. 5 over 15 would simplify to 1 third x to the fifth over x squared says subtract those and you end up with three x's left on top x to the third y to the fourth over y squared we subtract those and we end up with four minus two or y squared and then i just put it all back together notice i'm simplifying each piece exactly the same way we did on the previous slide and then i'm just reassembling it Here's one for you. 9x to the third, y to the fifth, over 18xy to the fourth. Again, I'm going to think of my numbers. I'm going to think of my x's. And I'm going to think of my y's. Does 9 over 18 simplify? Well, sure, that's 1 half. x to the third and x to the first, our new rule says I should subtract the exponents. This is going to be x squared y to the fifth and y to the fourth. Our new rule says to subtract those. This is going to be y to the first. One half, x squared, and y to the first. I just put it back together. One half, notice the one is on top, the two is on bottom. x squared says that I'm going to have two x's left over after I'm done simplifying, and those two are going to be on top. And then y to the fifth over y to the fourth, when I simplify those, I'm going to get four ones with one left over, one y left over on top. And I just put it back together. You might want to try pausing the video and trying the next one on your own. I'm going to assume you've already done that, and I'm just going to keep right on going. Again, I'm going to split it into four parts this time. 18 over 45 will simplify. I think those are both divisible by 9, aren't they? 2 fifths, so 2 on top, 5 on bottom. I have 6 x's on top, 1 on bottom. My new rule says I should subtract those. 6 minus 1 is 5. Since it's positive, it's going to be on top. This one's interesting. y to the fifth over y to the tenth. When I subtract these, I get y to the negative 5. y to the negative 5 says use the reciprocal and put that y on bottom. And then lastly, z to the 12th over z to the 7th, I subtract those and I get z to the 5th. y to the 5th over y to the 10th, remember, is y to the negative 5th, which will put the y to the 5th on bottom. Here's what we end up with. 18 over 45 is 2 fifths. 5 x's, it's positive, so I'm going to put it on top. y to the negative 5th says put the y to the 5th on bottom. And z to the 12th over z to the 7th gives me z to the positive 5, which is on top. And there you go. Again, I would suggest pausing this and trying it on your own before watching this. I'm going to assume you've already done that. Let's take a look at our pieces. The 24 and 32, I believe both of those are divisible by 8. Negative 24 divided by 8 would be negative 3. 32 divided by 8 would be positive 4. I'm going to subtract these, so negative 6 minus negative 7 makes positive 1. So I'm going to have a 1x left on top. 3 minus negative 2 is y to the 5th. 4 minus 6 is going to give me z to the negative 2, which means that my z squared will be on bottom. Again, when I subtract the x's, I get x to the first. That's going to be on top. When I subtract my y's, I get y to the fifth, which will be on top. When I subtract my z's, I get z to the negative second. That tells me I'm going to put my z to the second on the bottom. Your answer is going to look like this or this when I put it back together. One more time. Here's an interesting one. Um, notice I have an 11. That's the same as 11 over 1. This is a to the negative 5. A negative exponent says use the reciprocal. b to the negative third says use the reciprocal. And c squared is just itself, or we could write it over 1. Now that I've got all that written out, all i got to do is put it back together, and there's your answer.
This didn't really require a rule, but since we were already talking about division, I thought we'd at least look at this um, because it does it, it is similar. Assemble it, and there's your answer. A little tricky, right? But not too awful bad. Let's learn another rule. Once again, we're going to do three examples. I want you to look for a pattern that's going to help you to do this more quickly. Seven ninths to the third. Well, that's seven ninths times seven ninths times seven ninths. Or seven times seven times seven is seven to the third. Nine times nine times nine is nine to the third. Now, ideally, what you're going to want to be able to do is you're going to want to be able to get from this first example down to the end without having to do all this work in between. Notice I did go ahead and put it in simplest form over here, but it's hard to see the pattern when something's in simplest form. Seven, to, uh, seven ninths to the third looks like this. Do you see anything useful or interesting? Hold that thought. Pause the video and see if you can figure this one out without having to do expanded form. Maybe write it in a corner or something, something like that. I'm going to assume you've done that, and I'm going to keep going. In expanded form, it looks like this. 3 times 3 times 3 times 3. 5 times 5 times 5 times 5. Remember, we multiply the numerators. We multiply the denominators. You get 3 to the 4th over 5 to the 4th. The goal is to be able to get from here to here without having to do all of this in the middle. Do you see the pattern? In simplest form, it looks like this. One more time. Pause the video, see if you can figure it out using what you've already learned. I'm going to go ahead and do it in expanded form. When I multiply my numerators, I can see I have six x's multiplied together. When I do my denominator, I can see I have six y's multiplied together. Well, that's just x to the sixth over y to the sixth. Do you see the pattern? Hopefully you see it at this point, because in each case, if an exponent appears outside the parentheses, it applies to everything in the parentheses. So when I cube this, I've got to cube both the numerator and the denominator. When I do this to the fourth power, I've got to put the 3 to the fourth and the 5 to the fourth. And when I do this to the sixth, I have to take x to the sixth and y to the sixth. In fancy math terms, we call this the power of a quotient property which basically says the same thing. If you have a fraction in your parentheses and an exponent on the outside, just make sure you give that exponent to the numerator and the denominator. Let's try a few of these. How does this one look? 5 elevenths to the 11th? Well, just give this 11 to both of them. 5 to the 11 and 11 to the 11th. Normally, we would put this into standard form, but in my class, I tell my students, if it's going to be an unreasonably large number or an unreasonably large number, we go ahead and just leave it. I would never expect my students to do 5 to the 11th by hand. It's not worth the trouble. Can you do this one? How about x to the 4th over y to the 4th? How about this one? Again, pause the video if you want more time to work. This one says, give the 4 to the numerator and the denominator. So x cubed to the 4th, y to the 5th to the 4th. I have to go back and use a rule we learned in the last video, which is the power of a power property, which says, if I have an, a base with an exponent, and that whole thing is raised to another exponent, then I multiply these together. 3 times 4 is 12. 5 times 4 is 20. If this is uncomfortable to you, I'd recommend going back and watching that previous video. Here's one that's a little longer. Once again, I'd recommend pausing the video uh, and trying this. I'm going to go ahead and do it out the long way. Notice the exponent goes with both the top and with the bottom. And using our um, power of a product property from our last uh, lesson, I know that whatever's on the outside of this parentheses has to go with everything on the inside, and whatever's on the outside of this has to go with everything on the inside. So the 5 gets the 3, the a to the 6 gets the 3, the b cubed gets the 3, the c squared gets the 3, the d squared gets the 3. And then I just work that out, 5 to the 3rd, a to the, this is the power of a power property, that's 18, b to the 9 over c to the 6, and d to the 6. 
and you end up here. Now, I would tell you that you should be able to get from this first step down to this last step without doing the things in the middle with a little bit of practice. You may want not you may want to not do that right away because there is a lot of room for careless mistakes, but certainly the idea here is that we can realize that this three goes with everything on the inside. So we just go through to five to the third, a to the six to the third was eighteen, then nine, then six, then six. We don't want to have to do all these steps forever, but certainly if we get stuck, it's a worthwhile uh, endeavor to, to work it out the long way. Last one. Again, pause the video, try this on your own, see what you can do with this. Um, my suggestion to you is that before you go distributing this two out to everything inside of here, you might want to look and notice that there are some things in here that can simplify. You might find that it's easier to simplify the inside before squaring than it is to square and then simplify at the end. For example, I know that 14 over 21 is the same as 2 thirds. I also know that m to the 6 over m to the 7th I have to subtract the exponents and get m to the negative 1, or the reciprocal of m. n to the 4th over n to the 4th, if I subtract these using the, um, the quotient of powers property, I know this is going to be n to the 0, which is just 1. And I notice that there are no p's on top, so technically you could call, technically you could call this p to the 0 over p squared, no p's. Uh, minus 2 would give you p to the negative 2, which just basically says keep the p on bottom. If I simplify this, 2 times 1 times 1 times 1 is 2, and then 3 times 1 is 3, I just put all these together, and then I square both the numerator and the denominator. 2 squared is 4, 3 squared, m squared, p squared squared, becomes 9m squared p to the fourth. Hopefully this has been worthwhile and helpful for you. Um, hopefully it all made a little bit of sense. Um, these are, as I mentioned, the last of our exponent rules. I think you've got about six now. You want to make sure you know those really well because a lot of people find that when you are just using one of the rules, it's, um, it's not too difficult. But if you start trying to use multiple rules at the same time, it does get a little bit confusing. Um, in my class, we would actually spend the next several days just practicing with these, getting better and better at them before we moved on to the end of this unit, which is scientific notation. As always, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. I appreciate you being here. Make sure you leave us a comment in the comment section if you have some ideas for how we might improve or if there's something that's been particularly helpful to you. Make sure you like and subscribe. Make sure you ring that bell so that you uh, receive a notification anytime we present some new math for you here at Nunley Math. Uh, wish you all got the very best of luck. You guys take care of yourselves, all right?